In the last video, we talked about margin and the lack of it. We spent time thinking about how much we have going on and how to create space in our schedules. Well, in this video, we're going to explore what that space is used for. The very first words in the Bible say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The story we have heard our whole lives about creation is that God created everything in six days and on the seventh day, he rested. And that's true, but there's another layer to what's going on in Genesis 1 that adds a much deeper dynamic to the story. And that dynamic helps us learn how to follow God's example when it comes to rest. We've been very heavily influenced by Rene Descartes, who said, I think, therefore, I am. We descend from a culture that believed to think is to live, that our spirit and our mind were connected, that the ability to reason is the very thing that makes us human. Before that time, and in a different culture, the existence of humankind was identified differently. The book of Genesis was most likely written by Moses in the Far East thousands of years ago. At that time and in that culture, our existence wasn't defined by our ability to think and reason. It was defined by the purpose we serve. This is called a functional ontology. So with an intellectual ontology, things don't really exist until they can think and reason. But in functional ontology, things exist when they have a function or a purpose. Nowadays, we separate knowledge and function, and we know that things exist apart from both. If there is evidence of something, we believe it exists. This is why kids believe in Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy. It's why when we read about the first three days of creation, we accept that God put those things into existence. Day one, God created light and separated the light from the darkness. Day two, God created the sky. Day three, God created the land, the seas, and all kinds of plant life. But this is not the understanding with which Genesis 1 was written. Remember, if it didn't have a function, it didn't really exist. Put differently, functional ontology doesn't seek to explain that something exists. It seeks to explain why something exists. When we stop to think about that, we can see that Genesis 1 was written with a deeper purpose than we tend to give it. It's not there to tell us how God made everything. It's there to tell us why. Days 1 through 3 are a kind of prelude. So far, there's no real purpose to the things that God has created from a functional ontology perspective. So Moses and the hearers and eventual readers of his account, to them, nothing actually exists quite yet. It's like the whole universe is just being teed up. Let there be lights in the sky. Let the lights rule over the day and the night. Now, light and sky have a purpose, so they exist. Day four. Let the waters above and below be home to living creatures. Waters have a purpose. Now they exist. What's more, the creatures God created to inhabit the waters are immediately given a purpose. Be fruitful and multiply. Day five. God makes the creatures who live on the land in day six, culminating in humankind. Land has a purpose, so it exists. The animals eat vegetation, humans manage it all, all are blessed, all have a purpose. Now everything exists. And on the seventh day, God rested. Well, kind of. Genesis 2.2 says that he rested, but the rest of that passage says, by the seventh day, God finished the work he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. Then he blessed it and he made it holy and rested from all the work of creating that he had done. God didn't kick back and do nothing. He rested from the type of work he had been doing. And then he did something else. Did you catch it? God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. If God hadn't done something on that seventh day to give it purpose, to the original audience of Genesis, the seventh day wouldn't even have existed. Yet it does exist, and it exists as a day that is different, set apart, special when compared to the other days. Its purpose is to be holy. Here's maybe the coolest thing about this. 
God said it is good on every day, but on the last day, he looked at everything that he had made and he said it is very good. Then he shifted from creating everything to participating in his creation. So in an ideal world, we would work in a culminating fashion from week to week, everything building toward the point where we can stand, look back over the week and say it is very good before shifting gears into a different participation with God. Sabbath in this way is the climax of your week. And maybe for you, that's Saturday. For me, that's Monday. We don't need to overregulate it. The Pharisees did that and they wound up getting it all mixed up. They tried to corner Jesus in breaking the Sabbath laws, rules that were created to protect this sacred day from work, rules that lost sight of the very heart of Sabbath. And Jesus had this to say. In other words, God didn't make human beings rulers of the Sabbath. They don't serve it. God made the Sabbath for human beings. He knew even before the fall, even before sin drove a wedge between humans and God, before labor was backbreaking and the ground was unrelenting, God knew humankind would need a day set apart to center them on him, to worship him, to rest from the other work that they do, to do something holy with him. God made the Sabbath for us. So how do you Sabbath? This has been really hard for me to figure out. Until the past year, I didn't know how to set aside a day to stop the work that I had been doing the rest of the week. Even when I took time off, I was thinking about working or studying or stressing about the stuff that I wasn't getting done. Then, after hypocritically coaching my staff about honoring the Sabbath while burning the candles at both ends myself, I approached burnout for the second time and realized that something had to give. I wish I could say that it was fixed overnight, but it wasn't. I'm sure God was trying to work it out, but I was getting in his way. What happened was a slow shifting of priority and perspective. I started honoring my daily time with God more, and the more I did that, the more I wanted special time once a week. And then one day I realized Sabbath is one of the Ten Commandments. Honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. By working through that day, I was actually violating a known law of God. By working on the Sabbath, I was actually sinning. Now you might be thinking, that sounds kind of harsh. I mean, aren't we New Testament people? Yes, and Jesus affords us some flexibility on this, but I was consistently neglecting this day that God made for me a day he purposed to be holy and I was making it ordinary by working right through it like any other day. God gave us a model to follow. He gave us this day to rest, to take a break from our normal work and to participate in life with him in a different way. So how can we Sabbath? Do something special with God, do something for someone else, read something for fun, watch something you like, indulge in a hobby. Focus on God throughout the day. Do something different that reminds you of who he is, what he's done over the past week, and spend the day in gratitude. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do something for someone else. Reading is just good for us. It engages our imagination, it makes us smarter, it provides a fun way to pass the time. Don't try to learn in this. Read something you like like your favorite genre or a magazine or listen to an audiobook just for enjoyment. I don't endorse running away from problems, but I love a little bit of escapism through television. I think that's a part of why I'm drawn to cop dramas and comic book movies and why I don't watch shows about teaching or about church. I enjoy episodic shows, ones with stories that carry on across multiple episodes because I get wrapped up in characters and I lose myself in their stories and there's something therapeutic about it because they're not my problems and they're wrapped up in 42 minutes and I can walk away easily. Finally, we are made in the image of God, the creator, which means we're made to create. Hobbies often 
give us a great avenue to create something, which is why I like music. It's why I'm tinkering with learning how to play a new instrument and why my son loves carpentry and my wife loves crafts and my daughter loves to dance. Creating resonates with something inside of us that helps us connect with God in a different way. So do something special with God, do something for someone else, read something for fun, watch something you like, indulge in a hobby. Now, don't get this wrong, it's not a formula. I'm no Pharisee and I don't want this to become a list of rules, I just want to give you a guideline to help you explore what Sabbath looks like for you.